So thank you very much for the organizers, Nancy, and everyone for allowing me to come talk to you. I'm, I'm very optimistic about non-human primate research and cure, and I think some of the models we've developed and others have really helped, and I'm really excited about the possibility for this, um, in addition to other um, uses for non-human primates and HIV research. So my, from my perspective, the greatest advantage in non-human primate research in cure is the control over the viral challenge stock. This is something that we've been working on for years. So swarms generally have this diversity of a single patient, um, which is great because you're, you're, that's what you're modeling is a single patient. It, obviously, you're not modeling the, the global diversity of HIV, so you're modeling a single person. And it accumulates changes over time if you infect with a single virus. And then, of course, clonal stocks can be more consistent between animals and can, fi can facilitate replication between studies in different facilities um, but those are difficult uh, for different reasons. So for reservoir research, the most likely relevant model is to establish a diverse population similar to HIV infected for, and during the chronic infection, uh, although more and more often ART is initiated early. So those models are, are variable. So we sought to combine the advantages of both models, the clone and a, synthetic, and a swarm by using a synthetic swarm of identical virus with a genetic barcode. So let's go over the diversity just quickly of chronically HIV-infected individuals. This is 20-some um, patients um, with the patients are at the tips of these trees, and the distance between each patient is the long branches. And so this is the diversity of just subtype B in general. And then each individual patient shown here blown up, as you can see, the diversity is somewhere between 1 to 2 to 3 percent in the envelope gene in chronic infection. And of course, as Jeff showed yesterday, this is what we can model in a 251, um, in a, is, the, is what looks like a single person. But of course, each 251 was distinct, and this was uh, important because people were comparing studies across very distinct viruses. And of course, these all have founder populations, meaning that each lab that, out, that grew out their virus from in their lab uh, grew a slightly different population. These will expand and different people do this more and more often. So clones became really useful because you avoid this and you can make comparisons. And of course, when you infect with a clone or with a swarm at a low dose where you infect with a single virus, a single founder, this is what it looks like. This is a highlighter plot. This is the tree of this animal that was infected and we sampled at these two time points, the ramp up and peak time point. And what you can see here is there, there, you might be able to see, but there's no dots here. There's just lines, and all those sequences are identical. And then down here at the bottom, similar to the tree, you start to see very small changes, a few changes here and there. And this is the accumulation of changes uh, of diversity, which, which is gradual, um, at least in the time frames we're talking about for, for reservoir work. So Ma just presented this data. These are the, the diversity in her animals at the two-week time point at the peak viral load. And this is the diversity in all those animals that she showed at the eight-week time point. And each one, and this branch, this length of branch right here is one nucleotide change across the whole envelope one CP160. So in the two weeks time point, there's only no changes or one or two or three changes in average. And then that accumulates to three or four or five, maybe up to 10. But this is the type of population that, that we were digging through to try to find these individual founders. And there's just enough diversity to do that, um, but not any extra. Um, so our, our barcode is very simple. We insert it between the VPX and VPR gene. It's an MLU restriction site that we insert this, uh, the barcode itself. We make a very large library of this, and then we make virus stocks from these. Uh, the first virus we made, the first stock has about 10,000 um, different barcodes in it, and this allows us to infect the animal with different viruses um, that can seed all across the animal and able, allow us to track each lineage of virus over time. And the reproducibility of the <coughs> sequencing becomes very important because this is what we show is the proportion of each of these virus lineages as, as we track them in time. And this is a very simple um, method for the sequencing. Um, and this is replicates from two animals. These are 10 replicates. On the, on the y-axis is the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval of the, of the proportion of that barcode um, across all 10 replicates. And you can see for the dominant barcodes, you can't see the, the confidence interval on the scale because it's too small. 
And it's not until you get down way down several logs lower that you can actually start to see this. This is the point where each clone was found in all 10 replicates. And then below this, they're found in less than 10, but um, identifiable. And so with this simple method of our MySeq sequencing, we're able to sequence multiple logs worth of, of the barcode very accurately and reproducibly. Um, and, and, and so we've uh, used this on a big shout out to Lewis and AFAM for being early adopters. But we were able to infect over 150 rhesus or picked on macaques. This is the data from some of those animals. Um, we are able to dose the animals on the, um, with, with different input, um, a virus input uh, inoculum. And we, you see the, the growth curves here, the primary growth curves. The growth rates are all the same regardless of the dose, um, but just they're shifted in time based on how much we give. The number of barcodes, of course, is detectable and is dependent on dose. And then interesting, the largest barcode is important because that's a fraction of, uh, I'm sorry this is all out of focus, but if you can, don't care what the numbers are. But the largest barcode is dependent on the dose and is a, an estimate of what the population looks like in the animal. Um, when we look at the distribution of the stock of this, um, of 239M, um, and then compare that to all the animals we looked at, you can see that the vast majority of the stock is actually found in animals. And there are very few barcodes that are actually probably not replicative and not found in any of the animals. When you look across different tissues, this is plasma in black and PBMC in green in lymph nodes, you can see the same number of barcodes across all of these different animals. If you look in one animal and look across all these different time points during primary infection and all of these other um, cell compartments and cell subtypes, you can see the same barcodes in relatively the same proportion across all of these. So the virus is getting in different places. It's replicating normally. It obviously doesn't know it has a barcode. It's just replicating. And, it, it's, uh, and then we're just using this to, to track and follow these. So we've made several new barcodes. Um, I, don't, I swear I don't know why that's out of focus. I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to walk you through some of these because you can't read it. Um, SWMAC 239M2, we've done a, a repeat of the original M. This is a duplicate um, but has a much greater depth of, of barcodes. This has 150,000 barcodes. And this has a particular need that we had. We also have a virus called OPT5M. And these are the, five sub, the four suboptimal uh, nucleotides in 239 that were, have been documented since 239 was discovered. And we've corrected those and added one additional mutation. Um, and those are different SIVs that are, that are available for anyone to use. We've also barcoded several shivs. Here are four that I'll point out. We have a transmitted founder, subtype B, 1054M. Um, this, and then the, the, the 88 uh, EAOM clone from Mal Martin has been barcoded. Um, we've also barcoded two uh, transmitted founder subtype C um, shivs with mutations at 375, either a histidine or a tryptophan. These viruses grow um, similar to um, their parental in the, in, as shivs and as um, uh, SIV itself. Um, when you look at the distribution um, uh, within each stock, you can see we can define the barcodes. This becomes important for defining which um, sequences are part of each stock. Um, and then we look at the distribution of how far apart each uh, barcode is from another barcode. And you can see that they're, on average, about seven nucleotides different from each other. Um, these are the total number of barcodes for, and the distribution uh, across these new stocks. Um, you can see with M2 in total, there's about 150,000 um, and down to just several thousand in one of the shivs. But it ranges from 150 down to them. Um, the SWMAC 239 M2 has, has been placed into animals, and I won't show any data on that, but it's replication confident. And, is working fine in animals. We're titering it and other things. Um, these three shivs, the 88 EOM, uh, the 1054M, and 174M shiv C are all going into animals this week in our facility at MCI. Um, importantly, one reason we did um, the M2 was to allow for uh, multiple single of infection events uh, 
so to, to limit the number of, of duplicate infection events. So if you look at a 500 dose or 500 founder um, population, you can see with M, the original virus, you would have some 20, 20 or 30 um, individual cells that would be infected with the same barcode. But with a higher, with a higher number of barcodes in M2 at this dose, only, only one or two cells will actually have the same barcode. This allows us to have individual founders um, be infected with unique barcodes. And so we don't have any duplicates across the whole animal. And we can track from a single first cell all through um, whatever time we want to look at. And we're using this um, um, particular model for um, early infection events, um, for uh, rebound events and other things, so we can know for sure what the, what the virus is. So, but for research, for um, cure research, this is, the, this is our model of what we think is happening, where the, the original um, stopping art looking for uh, viral load, a measurable viral load, is really the time to detectable rebound. This is a great measure of the first reactivation event. So the first cell that was capable to produce virus that led to productive infection and led to a, a detectable rebound. Um, however, there's likely additional uh, reactivation events that can occur during this time and contribute to the total viral load. We've seen this in humans, but it's obviously much harder to, to identify these at multiple log um, differences in proportion. So what we're proposing is that the actual proportion of each of the barcodes or the proportion of different lineages by normal sequencing is a reflection of the number and the timing of the reactivation event that leads eventually to viremia. And there's been some criticism of this idea, meaning in that this first reactivation event might not be productive. That's fine. If it's not productive, we won't measure it, and we don't really care about it. Um, the second one might not be productive. All we're, all we're measuring are the things that lead to viremia, um, which I think are the most important things. So we performed a, a study where we treated art very early. We allowed the animals to be suppressed for almost a year, and then over a year, and then we released the animals in pairs. We measured their peak rebound um, to, to, to assess the number of barcodes. At the time of rebound, um, both the DNA and the RNA were very low, often below the limit of detection. But as you can see, the rebound occurred very rapidly and completely in, in each of the animals. When you look at the proportion of, of individual barcodes, you can see in this animal there were six barcodes detected. In, in this animal, at, at two weeks post uh, art um, uh, stoppage, um, these, this is the, in the dark line is the measured viral load. And the dash line is the theoretical viral load of each of the contributing um, six barcodes to the, to the total viral load. The reactivation rate is the, the average time between each of these lines, so the average time that each one of these cells would be activated and start producing virus that would then go on to, to be detectable in the plasma. Across all the animals, the average was one event every two days. And again, this was animals treated at day four. It was a high dose, but the reservoir was fairly small, often undetectable in the PBNC um, DNA compartment. And of course, if you look over time, either during the ramp up or the peak or the post peak, um, the same barcodes appear in the same animals at roughly the same proportion until you start to get adaptation. So at this time, we've, had, we've done several different models of the barcode virus. One is this very high dose, very early treatment. The viral loads reach uh, a reasonable amount, 10 to the fourth, I mean 10 to the fifth on average. You can also do a lower dose, so this is a 10,000 dose, so that's roughly all the barcodes. If you wait till day 10, the, the viral loads at 10 to the seventh. Um, you can do post peak. This was a high dose, but post peak. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, Lewis's studies uh, with a 200 dose and a day 12 art. So we have all these different things, and this allows us control over, over the model, what, when to start art, what the dose we're going to use, and other things. All of, these, all of this model um, that we've studied to date have been in early art treatment. 
We also have animals that were started at week eight. We haven't started animals um, later than that with a barcoded virus, but all of those seem a, like a reasonable model for cure research. One question that arose is how intact are the viruses during this kind of model? So we simply sequence the animals. These are our day 10 animals that I just showed you. Again, this is a highlighter. This now is a high, not the highlighter of the primary infection, but this is the highlighter of the DNA after nine months of ART. You can see that over half of the viruses during this time have no change in um, the entire genome. Uh, this, this is full genome sequencing. So nearly half the sequences have no change. Uh, Eighty-some percent only have one change. And then, of course, you do see defective genomes. You see apovec hypermutation. You see deletions, insertions. Um, this expands the, the number of polymorphisms, expands at the day 27 animals. We found we have a little clever uh, 23 um, real-time PCR assays that we can use to uh, screen animals for large deletions in apovec, and you can see these by missing uh, data points across this screen, so we can quickly screen for the proportion that have large deletions. And so the, the take-home is, is if you start art early and you are, are using this uh, suppressive therapy, you, the, the intactness is not a problem and almost all of the genomes are likely intact. And this is different than humans, of course, but it is the model we have. So, and in fact, if you start out at one year, um, in almost half of the genomes in the PBNC and the lymph node in total are still intact. Um, and so we don't think that this is an important uh, problem in, in this model. So um, the definitive study to correlate the reservoir size and the reactivation rate is a study with uh, Drs. Picker and Okoye. Um, here, five animals were um, treated with ART of the days indicated, five animals each day indicated. And you can see the viral load curves during their suppressive phase, their, their primary infection in the suppressive phase. And is this IV infection? These, will, these, will, these are IV infections. Everything I've shown you is an IV infection. This is the number and proportion of barcodes we found in these animals, the, the animals that were viremic, and of course it correlates to how viremic they were and how much virus we were able to, to sample. Um, when you look at the, sure, this is blowing up the system. When you look across um, different tissues, um, you can see the same number, it, and these are impossible to see, but the, the relative proportion of the barcodes stays consistent across time and you're looking for things that deviate, and you can see that most of them travel left to right um, consistently. And then if you, so what we're, this is the, this is simply the DNA levels um, during suppressive therapy. And what we're looking for, these animals, this is not data here, um, these animals have just been off therapy, but what we're hoping for is that these animals with a higher reservoir that started ART later will have a much higher reactivation rate, and we'll be able to finally quantify the, the reactivation rate to the, the reservoir size and have a, a precise measure of that. So barcoded viruses for cure, um, the vast majority of these barcoded viruses in the first stock were replication competent in vivo. Um, they provide key insights into measuring changes in the rebound competent reservoir. There's con tight control over the number of variants, the primary growth kinetics, and the reactivation rate. It allows for assess a, a sensitive assessment of the viral decline, blips, clonal expansion, and reseeding. There are four barcoded ship stocks that are functional and available for use. Uh, next generation M2 stocks have 150 barco 150,000 barcodes and again are available for use. Um, most animals utilizing barcoded clones would likely be treated early and have intact viruses. Uh, and while this model is not an exact recapitulation of late ART and chronically infected people on ART for decades, it is a model of persistent virus over time that allows for a precise assessment of the dynamics and reservoir establishment, maintenance, and uh, subsequent rebound. Um, some of the fundamental features that we're looking at um, besides reactivation and rebound is the pre-therapy um, population, its dynamics uh, during primary infection. 
that during the decline phase, the, the changes in the population as art is initiated, the maintenance phase, including blips of virus, that would be um, very challenging to sequence otherwise. And we can look at uh, both the cellular compartment and the cell-free compartment. We can look at the evolution over time. We can look at clonal expansion. Sorry. And finally, um, the reservoir receding. So when you have an ATI, what happens to the cellular reservoir during this ATI with uh, high resolution. Beyond cure, um, barcode viruses are helpful, and we're using them in transmission studies, mucosal exposure, and trafficking, and, and trafficking lineages. Um, looking at single founder um, events um, following IV infection and early necropsy. We're also using these um, during, to assess the viral dynamics during immune escape. We've completed a study with TAT escalate escape um, where thousands of individual lineages have survived. We're looking at antibody and other CTL uh, escape selection right now. And we can also use this to assess individual lineage dynamics of drug escape, so the number of variants escaping a mono or dual therapy. And I just want to acknowledge um, Christine is the one that helped uh, make this original barcode of virus. She just had a little baby girl two days ago, super cute little thing. Sean O'Brien has done all the molecular clones. Um, Greg Del Pratt and Jeff Liston are my main collaborators. Miles Davenport um, has really helped us define the model. Uh, as I mentioned, Lewis and FM have been early adopters. And I just want to acknowledge the DARE collaborator collaboration and the Office of AIDS Research, who both provided supplemental funding um, to get the Spark model started. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Brandon. We, we can just take one. Quickie. Um, it's a great system. And I'd like to implore you to add one more barcode to the stocks, which is the stock number. In other words, you would have a different set of barcodes for one stock versus another, so we can use them in repetitive challenge and know yeah. which stock took. Yeah, so all, all of the shivs are differentially barcoded. And we can, but the SIVs are not. The, the analysis of each stock is very, is very labor intensive and time consuming. So we don't want to make a lot of stocks with the same thing, but, but this, the, SI, the two SIVs are different. One approach to get around that may be to put a library ID and so you can, I mean, that's what we do in some of the studies I'll talk about later with cellular barcoding. So you can have, you know, a six or ten base pair of library ID that's the same for the whole library right. and the barcode after that. And then you can have repeated or, you know, we do yeah. transplants of multiple different right. fractions of cells and we can easily deconvolute that. And that's one way around so the issue of having to have different barcodes. Right. You can have the same barcode library with different library IDs. Right. So that's, so we do that. We all of our flanking regions are unique to a specific um, stock. We just didn't do, we, we kept the same for the SIV. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.